thank you for uh, having me. It's it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Saib Khalsa. I'm the director of clinical operations at LIBOR um, and an associate uh, professor at the University of Tulsa, as well as um, most recently the director of the LIBOR Float Clinic and Research Center. Um, so today I'm uh, pleased to talk with you about um, some uh, new findings. Uh, the title of my talk is Impact of Flotation Therapy on, Ana on Body Image and uh, Anxiety in Anorexia Nervosa, a Randomized Clinical Efficacy Trial. Um, and although it's remote in pandemic times, I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you uh, virtually. I hope you're all doing well um, and are safe. So um, first I'd like to start out with, uh, I have no financial uh, disclosures related to this talk. Um, and also, uh, I'd like to emphasize uh, at the outset of this talk that uh, clinical trials are a huge team effort. And I want to start by really acknowledging the team that helped make this possible, and especially the people who made strong contributions to this work, um, whose names are listed in bold. In particular, um, my longtime uh, colleague uh, and friend, Justin Feinstein, um, as well as Flux, uh, who's done a lot of wonderful analysis uh, related to this project. Um, Scott Mosman, the director of the Eating Disorders Program at the Laureate uh, Eating Disorders um, Center, uh, as well as Martin Paulus, the scientific director of LIBOR. So uh, I've organized the talk into three parts, uh, kind of the past, present, and the future. Uh, I'm going to start by um, giving you a, a reminder uh, of the previous study of uh, floating and anorexia nervosa that we undertook since it's been a few years since I've been back here, and uh, there's likely many people in the audience who are new. Then I'll talk about the present uh, study, uh, which is a current uh, randomized clinical efficacy trial, uh, and then uh, end on the future implications of this work. So um, to begin with, uh, I'd like to introduce you to anorexia nervosa, which is a rare, uh, affecting about 1% of the population, but extremely deadly uh, disorder. Um, uh, it has uh, mortality rates uh, on par with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, and it affects um, women uh, 10 times um, to uh, every one male, although it does affect males. Uh, and current treatments for this condition uh, the psychiatric disorder uh, really only have moderate efficacy. We're really struggling right now um, to find ways to help people um, recover from eating disorders. Uh, medications play a pretty limited in role, a limited role in treatment, as you'll see. Um, and in terms of the definition of this uh, disorder, we don't have any real um, uh, sort of objective uh, biomarkers um, for indicating anorexia nervosa other than severe food restriction that causes a distinct weight loss. Um, that combined with an intense fear of weight gain and a disturbance um, in body image perception, um, as exemplified in this um, uh, cartoon over here, where we have a slender female uh, looking in the mirror um, and seeing uh, uh, somebody that is uh, obese and certainly not in proportion to um, the image uh, of her body that everyone else sees. So those are the three uh, classic uh, diagnostic criteria for um, giving somebody uh, an anorexia nervosa diagnosis. However, we know uh, that uh, there are a lot of other associated features that are relevant to the disorder. So heightened anxiety, um, high levels of, of, of obsessionality and perfectionism um, at the level of personality traits go hand in hand with this disorder. Oftentimes these are present um, even before somebody has a diagnosis. And then, uh, difficulty recognizing internal body sensations and emotional states. So these are individuals who often feel full after eating a, a very tiny amount of food. They often experience abdominal bloating or cramping. Um, and uh, as a disorder, um, these latter um, uh, uh, aspects have not really been integrated into diagnosis, but it's well known at a clinical level um, that they're very difficult to treat and they're poorly understood. So in that regard, um, what I'm really going to focus on in this talk is uh, uh, body image and anxiety. Um, and uh, in a separate line of research, I focus a lot on um, understanding uh, the manner in which um, these individuals have difficulty recognizing their internal body sensations. So I'd like to start um, with a, a sort of announcement. I'm proud, proud to indicate that, um, that the initial trial that we um, presented a few years ago at the FLOAT conference has been uh, officially published. Um, this is the manuscript. You can find out 
uh, find it in this journal, uh, Frontiers in Psychology. It was published in October of last year. Um, and this was a, a safety study. So it was an, what we call an early phase clinical trial. Um, we were just uh, getting a look at how uh, patients with this disorder would respond um, when um, being uh, exposed to the float environment. We really had no clear sense of how that would go. We had some hypotheses, so we thought that it could be safe. Um, and we made several predictions, the first being that there would not be any adverse physical effects, such as dizziness, falls, or blood pressure drops. Um, these are things that are commonly encountered um, in the disorder, uh, particularly when people are um, acutely underweight um, and about to be hospitalized or are hospitalized. Um, we also thought that there would not be um, major adverse subjective effects. In other words, that it would not worsen people's anxiety levels, their stress or mood, or other aspects of their body sensation or body image. Um, again, these are things that are often heightened in these individuals. And so uh, we uh, were aware of the possibility that they could be increased, but we actually uh, thought that floating would not adversely impact um, these uh, effects. And then finally, of course, um, uh, something that's probably more familiar to most of you and the reason why many of you um, find floating so useful in your lives is that um, there's the possibility of positive effects on, on these variables. So one thing um, when I talk about uh, floating, uh, sorry, when I talk about clinical trials uh, with my students, um, and uh, one of the first things that I emphasize is that a clinical trial is essentially um, a hypothesis test uh, in which you develop a hypothesis and you use statistical methodology to ask a question of the universe um, and get an answer. And you really can only get um, effectively one answer. Um, that's baked into something called a primary outcome. Um, you can have a, a bunch of other questions in mind and you can look at other uh, ideas, but from the standpoint of powering your study um, for a particular um, question, you really can only have one outcome. So in our study, um, we had the primary outcome uh, that there would be no adverse physical effects because we felt like if um, there were any adverse physical effects that we observed, then that would even prevent the study of um, potential subjective effects for clinical benefit. Um, we did look at these um, other effects as secondary outcomes um, in the paper that I just mentioned. Um, but again, we only had one primary outcome that we could really focus our, our um, inferences on. This was the structure of the study. It was a four float study and again, because um, it was the first time anyone had taken um, patients with a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa into a float environment. We used a graduated approach where they started by floating in a chair, which we considered to have some of the um, uh, elements of uh, flotation, but not obviously um, the ones that involve um, being in a pool um, filled with uh, Epsom salt. Um, we transitioned them to the open pool at Liber uh, and then um, finally gave them uh, exposure to the domed pool. Um, and uh, this open pool was a feature um, that, uh, that Justin sort of um, originated in, in uh, collaboration with the folks at FloatAway. Um, and it's been very effective at uh, helping uh, individuals with heightened levels of anxiety tolerate um, exposure to an environment that where they normally often report um, claustrophobia and, and whatnot. Um, we had a bunch of uh, wireless and waterproof sensors for measuring blood pressure and heart rate. Um, and we also gave them an experience of floating um, without sensors as well, just so they could have that. We could look at subjective effects. So um, in a clinical trial, you have to track things very carefully. So this is our flow diagram uh, that describes um, how we brought people through the study. Um, we considered 51 outpatients um, with a diagnosis of AN um, for the study. And we ultimately ended up only consenting 23 um, for the study. Um, we were targeting uh, to get a total of about 22, and we ended up with a little more than that. Um, we had 21 who completed all four uh, float sessions, and we included all of them in the analysis. If you're interested in um, some of the um, uh, details, uh, you can look at this clinicaltrials.gov identifier for how we um, designed the study at the outset before we started collecting any data. In terms of our primary outcome, uh, we were looking to see whether these patients would show um, orthostatic uh, blood pressure changes. In particular, would they have blood pressure drops when they stood up out of the float pool um, that could cause them to feel dizzy, that could potentially lead them to fall and bonk their head when getting out of the pool. 
Um, and in this case, uh, we did not find any evidence of orthostasis, either in systolic blood pressure, which is basically, these are all the dots reflecting each individual in the study. We would have had to have seen one of these dots or more uh, below this red line. We did not see that. Uh, we didn't see that either for the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure uh, measure right there. So that finding um, gave us a lot of confidence in the ability to um, continue looking forward um, at uh, doing other uh, studies in this population. Uh, although I'm not showing it here, we looked at other subjective effects um, uh, and uh, like um, physical discomfort, other kinds of um, uh, medical conditions. We did not see an increase um, in um, physical uh, adverse effects in that study. Uh, in terms of subjective effects, kind of the, the positive effects that we were considering might happen, we saw evidence for that. So um, it may not surprise you to see that um, we found um, stress uh, um, and anxiety reduction. So this is a um, self-report scale, basically an anxiety questionnaire that we gave patients before and then after uh, each of their floats. And what you can see is that um, these are the raw scores on the scale, which uh, has a range the way it's scored from 20 all the way up to 80. Um, so 20, somebody with a state score of 20, a state anxiety score of 20 would be very low. Um, whereas somebody who is in the 40 to 50 range, as you can see here, um, is actually fairly elevated. Healthy individuals usually tend to be much lower. Uh, and so what you can see is that across each of the float sessions, we, we saw statistically significant um, reductions um, in the amount of anxiety that they experienced um, after being in each of the float sessions. Um, when we looked at measures of what's called effect size, which is really kind of the distance between these two averages, um, we found that the uh, effect uh, on anxiety was actually very large. Uh, and again, this may not surprise um, all the float aficionados. Um, I think this is uh, kind of consistent um, with a lot of the, the anxiety and stress reducing um, uh, experiences that people have in the absence of even using one of these anxiety scales. Now, um, we also looked at body image and, and um, one thing that I didn't um, emphasize in the beginning of the talk is that um, body image is something that uh, really uh, is one of the last um, clinical characteristics of anorexia nervosa to change. So um, bringing people from an underweight state back into a normal weight state um, uh, is the primary focus of treatment. It's well recognized that body image um, is fairly inflexible, um, even by the time people are well enough to leave the hospital. So um, we were very pleased in that regard when we found uh, some evidence uh, of a change in body image disturbance. And this is um, looking at um, something called the POMP or the percentage of maximum possible change uh, that looks at the, the amount of change that you can see across the range of an, of an entire scale. Um, in this case, we, were, we saw some um, differences, statistically significant differences in a measure called body image dissatisfaction on um, something called the photographic figure rating scale. Um, and those effect sizes um, had a range, um, but on average, they were in the medium uh, effect uh, uh, range, as you can see. Um, so what was this scale exactly, this photographic figure rating scale? As you can imagine, there's photographs with figures and there are ratings that are being made. So here's an example um, uh, of an image. Um, so basically individuals are looking at um, uh, images of um, female bodies with the faces obscured. Um, there's a range of different bodies um, and they're indicating the one that they think best reflects the body that they currently see as well as the body that they would like to have. Now um, in anorexia nervosa, the typical pattern uh, let's say this was um, uh, somebody's um, actual BMI. Uh, they might uh, look at uh, themselves and say, oh, well, I actually, this is how I look. Um, and then when you ask them, well, what's the, what's the kind of body that you want to have? Um, this is uh, not an uncommon um, uh, pattern for you to see. So this was certainly what we saw in our, our participants pre-float, um, but um, the general pattern of the finding post-float was a bit of a normalization. So um, kind of something like this, where you can see that um, uh, there was a reduction in the difference between the current body that they saw um, and the ideal body, um, such that uh, it was more normalized to the actual body um, that they inhabit. Um, and, and 
in this regard, you know, this is a very visually based scale. Um, uh, we sort of interpreted this as if it's almost as if they saw themselves differently. So um, in terms of the conclusions from this study, we were, we were sort of optimistic. Um, we found that um, uh, partially weight restored outpatients with anorexia nervosa had tolerance of the physical and mental effects of floating. Um, but more than that, um, we saw some acute anxiety reductions that were fairly large. This ended up being about 15% of the percent of maximum possible change. So you could say a 15% total reduction on the um, state trait anxiety inventory. And then we also saw improvements in body image dissatisfaction. And those were smaller um, on the order of about 4.7% on this photographic figure rating scale. Um, so based on these uh, data, um, we decided to move ahead um, on what's called a randomized clinical trial um, to investigate the efficacy of floating in reducing these symptoms. So um, in the previous study that I just presented, there was really only one group um, that uh, went through and experienced floating. We didn't have uh, what's called a control or a comparator group. Um, and so one criticism of that study could be that, well, you know, everybody knew that they were floating and um, uh, you would really have difficulty disentangling the expectations of floating um, from, uh, from, um, from the study uh, itself because you didn't have a control group. So um, the next step in that process uh, of doing clinical trials would be to have a control group. So that's what we did. And so I'm gonna present the results, uh, initial results from that study here. Um, what I'd like to emphasize uh, another point is that um, the first study was a safety study, um, and this study is what we call a clinical efficacy study. So here, um, our target really is um, uh, improvement in symptoms related to the disorder. In other words, um, is there a therapeutic effect? Our hypothesis uh, was that floating uh, would reduce uh, body image disturbance and anxiety symptoms. Um, uh, this time, uh, we decided to focus on inpatients, so a more acutely ill group um, who were being treated in the Laureate uh, Eating Disorders Program, which is housed in the same building as LIBOR. Um, and we thought that floating would um, show evidence of reductions in anxiety and improvements in um, a body image relative to a, um, a usual care comparator group. And I'll explain what the, what the usual care is. In a moment. Um, so this was our goal. Uh, if you want to read more about the details of the study, um, you can look at clinicaltrials.gov, uh, this identifier over here. Um, uh, we uh, took a lot of what we learned from the previous study. In fact, we used a lot of the data that we gathered from the previous study um, to conduct what's called a power analysis, um, which allowed us to say, based on the effects that we observed in the previous study, how many participants do we think that we would need um, to recruit in order to see an effect of floating versus usual care? And when we did that, um, what we found is that um, for our primary outcome, we would need about um, 44 patients um, in the flotation therapy um, arm and then 22 in the uh, usual care arm. We decided to randomize them on a two to one ratio such that more people uh, were randomized to flotation therapy. Um, and this was a true randomization. We had a, um, a, a randomization list developed by a statistician. Um, so it wasn't that um, myself or the research coordinator involved sort of got to pick um, who, um, uh, who got to float based on their preference. This was really randomized. And we had several people, in fact, who were very unhappy um, that they were randomized to one arm versus another. But, um, but you know, that was part of the agreement of them doing the study. So, um, what we decided to do was um, to take these individuals and administer um, a larger number of float sessions. So instead of four float sessions, uh, we doubled the number to eight. Um, we also shortened the duration of the float to one hour. Um, part of this was pragmatic because um, these are inpatients um, on the treatment uh, unit. Um, it's very difficult for us to get um, some of their time. Um, but we also felt that um, a one hour float uh, might be adequate uh, enough um, to see certain effects. So um, what we did is people in the float group, um, we uh, brought them from the unit down to uh, the float clinic and then they floated. Um, and the people who were in the usual care arm were receiving their regular um, clinical programming, their clinical treatment on an inpatient basis. 
Um, and what we did is we found them on the unit and we just gave them the same uh, measures um, at, at a certain time point and then about an hour later. Um, and that would allow us to get a really good baseline of, well, if their um, symptoms were to improve simply because they knew they were in a clinical trial, um, then we would be able to detect that. Um, we also planned to do uh, longitudinal follow-ups of uh, six weeks, six months, and one year. Uh, and the goal here is to look at um, whether or not uh, the effects that we would see, or at least that we were hypothesizing we would see, um, would carry on um, uh, over a longer term period, um, which if that was the case, it would tell us that there's um, uh, additional sort of um, uh, measures of the uh, validity and the utility of this um, in treatment settings. So uh, what is usual care, this, this sort of UC acronym that I have here? Um, so at the Laureate Eating Disorders Program, uh, it's a highly individualized uh, uh, program. This is our, our campus. Um, the eating disorder unit is over here, and then um, the, the uh, kitchen and the dining hall is over here. Um, and we have two tracks. We have an adolescent and an adult track. So we have um, adolescents between the ages of 13 and 17 receiving treatment and adults uh, 18 and over. Uh, and it's a multidisciplinary treatment. So um, it involves physicians, whether they're psychiatrists, internal medicine, or other specialists as needed, um, nurses, licensed behavioral therapists, registered dietitians, a chef, uh, a yoga teacher, and a school coordinator for the adolescents. So it's, it's really a comprehensive treatment program. Um, it also, uh, in addition to medication, involves an intensive psychotherapy and relationship-based program uh, with up to 40 hours of clinician-led individual group and family therapy each week. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, medications have a role, but it's rather limited um, in treating uh, anorexia nervosa. And so um, therapy is, is quite a heavy component. Uh, there are five levels of care, um, starting with the most acute, uh, hos acute hospitalization uh, when somebody is severely underweight. Um, and then once um, their weight has been restored to a, a reasonable degree and they're no longer at certain medical risks like orthostatic uh, blood pressure drops, dizziness, um, having a slowed heart rate, um, they can transition to something called residential care. And then uh, as they move through these different levels, um, they get more and more independent. Um, and so uh, this is going to be important when we talk about what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are. For the study and i won't go into all these in detail i'm just showing this to you um, so you have a sense of uh, the thoroughness and and sort of all the criteria that um that we required in order for somebody to move ahead um, so the primary diagnosis had to be of anorexia nervosa they had to have a weight uh, a body mass index above uh, a, a, a sort of a very low level no orthostatic hypotension but importantly they had to have gone from that acute stage of clinical treatment to more of a residential stage. Um, and that allowed us to be reasonably confident that they could leave the unit, um, walk outside uh, and walk down to our uh, float clinic and, and float. Um, we had a number of uh, exclusion criteria, not, no acute suicidal ideation or cutting. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, um, screening individuals with this level of detail who are this ill um, requires a lot of coordination. And so that um, really happened with close partnership with the Laureate Eating Disorders Program. So how did we define our um, outcome? So uh, as I mentioned before, it, you really have one hypothesis test, which has to be crystallized into um, one primary outcome or endpoint. Uh, and this is how we did that. So we, um, we decided in looking at the effect sizes and seeing that we saw effects on anxiety as well as body image, um, that we would decide to uh, focus primarily on body image um, and particularly body dissatisfaction scores on the photographic figure rating scale because uh, that aspect of body image is because body image is so difficult to change um, in clinical practice. We're reasonably sure that we would see something with anxiety as well, um, but we thought that if we could um, see a difference in body image, that would be um, particularly noteworthy. So we define that outcome um, as uh, body dissatisfaction, which is the, the current body image um, rating subtracted from the ideal body image rating um, assessed before and after each of the eight floats. So that's our sort of um, immediate uh, primary outcome measure. And then again, uh, assessed at six weeks, six months, and one year follow-up to see if there's a longitudinal 
sort of a long lasting impact. Um, so that's the primary endpoint. We had a number of secondary endpoints. I won't go into all of them. Um, today, I'll really be presenting uh, results from this secondary endpoint, which was the change in um, anxiety level on the state trade anxiety inventory, the same scale uh, that I showed you before, again, before and after each intervention, and then at six weeks, six month, and one year follow-ups. Um, okay, so uh, in this regard, uh, this is what we, these are the participants that we brought through. So here's our participant flow diagram. Uh, we, I'll walk you through it. We considered 133 people um, as being eligible, and this included people that we knew of who were on the unit, not necessarily people that we consented or screened. Um, we ended up consenting 86 people. Um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, in the COVID era, we ended up having to exclude uh, some people who received uh, COVID-19 diagnoses um, during their, their stay. Um, and so uh, what that uh, we ended up with was we um, allocated or randomized 45 individuals to the flotation therapy arm and 23 to the usual care arm. Um, we had a number of people who um, didn't complete all of their eight floats. Usually this was because um, uh, they were discharged from the hospital before we could complete their floats. Um, but you can see it, we ended up completing eight, eight floats and eight usual care measurements um, from uh, uh, nearly 60 people. Uh, and in our analyses, we were able to integrate these people such that um, in total, we actually had 67 people included um, in the analysis, which was one more than we anticipated needing based on our power analysis. So who were these people? I'm going to show you a very uh, detailed chart, and I'll walk you through it very briefly. Um, but these are the numbers, and I think it's important that, um, that uh, you be able to see this information to evaluate it for yourself. So they were all females. Um, that's based on uh, the uh, requirements of the Laureate Eating Disorder Program. Um, they did not differ in age. They were all fairly young, uh, around 20 years on average. Um, no differences in the years of education. Um, importantly, no differences in the amount of um, uh, diagnoses of major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, or uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, which are commonly co-occurring in this population. Um, no baseline differences in their level of body image dissatisfaction. Um, this is important if you're going to be looking for differences between groups. You don't want the two groups to start out on an uneven level. Similarly, no differences in uh, their levels of trait anxiety on this um, same uh, state trade anxiety inventory. Um, and with anxiety levels of 60, um, you can bet that that's pretty high on that scale. Um, they also had no difference in their body mass index at admission uh, or the lowest BMI that they had ever um, uh, experienced. Um, we did see, uh, interestingly, some evidence. So there was, um, for whatever reason, uh, statistically greater numbers of people um, taking psychotropic medications in the float group. Um, and maybe even somewhat uh, in terms of having a longer illness duration. Um, uh, but again, that was, uh, uh, we assume that was uh, occurred by chance because these people were randomized. Uh, and importantly, um, they did not differ in all of these other clinically relevant measures. Okay, so I've been talking a lot uh, about the, the setup of the study. Um, what did we find? Um, the first thing uh, is that um, when we looked at the average float duration, um, the average float duration was about 49 minutes. So most people uh, lasted most of the time. Um, and in terms of our primary outcome uh, on body image, uh, we actually found an effect. So when we looked at um, the acute changes in body image dissatisfaction on the photographic figure rating scale, um, these little dots reflect all of the um, data for people uh, in each of the arms for each of their floats. So we're looking at the average effect pre-float versus post-float across all eight floats, which is how we designed it. And these um, horizontal or these solid lines reflect sort of the change, the average change in, in each group. And what you can see is that there's, you know, these, these group, these lines are not parallel, they're not overlapping. Um, and that's associated with a statistically significant group by time interaction, whereby the, the people in the float group uh, actually had um, a uh, um, lower degree of body image dissatisfaction. Um, when we uh, looked at the, um, the sort of effect size, uh, 
um, we found that the um, float group had a 4.9% reduction of that POMP scale, um, whereas the usual care really showed a minimal, uh, if any, reduction. Um, when we looked at the effect size, um, this was actually a bit smaller than what we saw um, with the uh, initial study. But again, um, this is a statistically significant finding and it, and it is um, in line uh, with the, the outcome that we predicted. Um, just for reference, uh, the, to remind you that the POMP uh, reduction that we saw in the outpatient study, the safety study was 4.7% versus 4.9%. So I'm pretty confident that, um, that this is a legitimate um, impact of floating on this aspect of body image. Um, now, this is uh, taking the, uh, um, the float effect across all eight floats. Um, what I'll show you next uh, is data looking at um, uh, the uh, body image dissatisfaction for each of the eight sessions um, that we did. And what you can see is that for the most part, um, the effect is consistently occurring across all the sessions. Um, for whatever reason, in sessions five and six, we don't really see uh, the groups showing a difference. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, point when I, uh, at the end of the talk, um, when I talk about the implications. So um, that was our primary outcome. Again, one hypothesis test, um, and uh, we found evidence um, in support of the hypothesis. Um, but we also have other hypotheses that we can test. And so uh, in terms of our secondary outcome, in terms of anxiety, uh, this, this was state uh, anxiety, we actually see a much larger effect um, you can see that these lines uh, are much further apart. Um, the um, statistical significance value or the p-value uh, is much, much, much lower. Um, and uh, when we look at the effect size, uh, in this case, we saw a POMP reduction of uh, 20% um, uh, versus a 0.2% reduction in the usual care group, basically no reduction. Um, that's a very large effect size. Um, and this, again, reflects the um, average change across all the sessions. Um, for a reminder, um, with the uh, initial study, the POMP change was actually 15.2%. So the anxiety reduction in the inpatients uh, of 19.7% is actually um, even larger. Um, and um, so uh, I think this is um, quite meaningful. Um, it's evident. Uh, at each individual session, even more so than uh, for the body image results, you can see that the usual care group um, really showing minimal reductions um, and the float group showing large reductions. Um, one thing that you can see from this pattern is that the usual care group kind of started out with higher anxiety levels. And then over time, their anxiety in relation to just having anxiety measured changed somewhat. Um, the float group didn't seem to have as much change, um, but again, what we're really looking at is the difference between the pre and the post float um, uh, measurement for the float group and then the usual care uh, measurement as well. Um, so um, very uh, statistically significant finding on our secondary outcome with a very large effect size. Um, okay, so uh, that's most of the data that I uh, planned to show you today. Um, I wanna sort of review where we're at uh, and give you a sense of just what goes into these kinds of studies. So uh, we first randomized, we randomized our first patient in April of 2018. Uh, we enrolled our last patient in March of 2021. Um, so our enrollment is 100% complete. Um, and if you recall, we were uh, gonna do follow-up up to uh, a one-year time point. So our last follow-up is actually not scheduled to March of 2022, which is why I'm not presenting um, any of the follow-up data here. So in terms of the status on this study, you know, we're kind of a glass nearly full. Uh, I'd prefer to look at it that way than nearly empty. Um, and uh, I am pleased with our follow-up data. Um, our follow-up rates at this point are quite high. Um, usually what you want to see in a clinical trial is an 80% or greater follow-up rate. And usually over time, you see a drop-off. So we're getting good follow-up and I'm, I'm confident that um, by the time we are able to get our last follow-up, we'll be able to analyze the follow-up data um, and have more information to share in that regard. Okay, so in terms of the uh, implications um, of this work moving forward, uh, let's talk about that. So first, uh, 
This randomized control trial, uh, or RCT, uh, demonstrates floating's efficacy in reducing anxiety and body image symptoms in inpatients uh, with eating with anorexia nervosa. Um, there's we have evidence of clinical efficacy, um, and there's sort of two points that I want to emphasize in this regard. Um, the first is that any change in body image is a big deal, given the rigidity of this construct in treatment, um, and we're definitely seeing evidence of that. We don't know if that if the evidence um, is sustained over the long term, um, but I've shown pretty clearly that um, that we do actually uh, move one of these measures of, of body image um, as a result of float. Um, now, the second thing is that we found a, a pretty large um, effect size uh, reduction in anxiety. Um, so, in this population, we know that medications for anxiety, such as benzodiazepines, um, are pretty ineffective in treating anxiety and eating disorders. They also have side effects such as tolerance and they have addictive potential. Uh, and so in this regard, um, floating could potentially be viewed as a behavioral benzodiazepine or a, a non-pharmacologic option, one that has few side effects and as you can see, um, has a pretty strong uh, acute impact on anxiety levels. So what would we use this for? What are potential implications in a clinical context? Uh, I'd like to highlight two that I think of, but um, when I move to the breakout room, I'd be curious to hear any other thoughts from you. Um, the first is uh, the potential for float-assisted augmentation of psychotherapies um, that are focused on body image or anxiety. Um, there are psychotherapies that are specifically focused on each of these. Um, so the idea would be that maybe somebody floats and you get them into a state where they've experienced a change in their body image or their anxiety. Um, you uh, then work with them in a psychotherapeutic context um, using uh, other tools and techniques, maybe cognitive reappraisal techniques or other behavioral techniques. Um, alternatively, maybe uh, you could start with a psychotherapy session um, working on those uh, techniques and then um, bring somebody into a float environment. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, of exploration um, and investigation that could be had in that front. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is very interesting and worth pursuing is float-assisted augmentation of meal-related anxiety. Um, so we know that uh, the surest way to make somebody with anorexia nervosa anxious is to put food in front of them. Um, that's a main hallmark of the disorder. Some people view them as anxiety disorders where the focus um, of fear is food. So if you can reduce anxiety to such a large extent with floating, um, what happens then when you put a meal in front of them? What happens then in treatment where uh, that usual care of that sort of 40 hours plus of full-time work where they're trying to um, put on weight again in a very supervised setting, learn how to eat healthy. Uh, what happens if you use bloating as a potential tool um, to help them uh, overcome their fear of food? So I think um, those are two uh, avenues that would be, um, that would, would sort of be probably immediate and natural next step. Of course, there could be others and I look forward to hearing more. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I think uh, we've shown so far that in these two studies, that individuals with anorexia nervosa uh, across the illness spectrum can safely tolerate uh, the flotation therapy experience. Um, I think that's important that we didn't know that before. Um, we, had, we now have evidence of short-term improvements in body image disturbance um, and acute anxiety levels across two clinical trials. Um, the magnitude of the effect size um, is, uh, is small for body image, but it's very large for anxiety and, and you know, the overall change is consistent. Um, so I think it's uh, reliable and I think it's reasonable to expect that you would see that um, in other uh, uh, settings. Um, we also saw it with the first float. So it may be that uh, in order to have these impacts, um, you don't necessarily need to have multiple floats if all you're targeting is an acute anxiety reduction or uh, trying to budge body image in, in a particular way for treatment, uh, maybe one or two floats is enough to begin working with somebody on, on these um, challenges. Um, as I mentioned, the, the magnitude of the effect is consistent. Um, we don't know whether these effects uh, are sustained over the long term. And um, one thing that I can tell you, uh, we know from the clinical literature is that these patients frequently relapse even within uh, the first year 
um, of being discharged from the hospital. So it's not uncommon um, for people to re-encounter triggers of their eating disorder and to have challenges maintaining their clinical improvement. So um, I'm not exactly sure what we'll see um, in our longer term follow-up, uh, but uh, as soon as we have it, I'll report it. Um, the final thing is that uh, really the neurobiological mechanisms of these effects await discovery. So, um, you know, we don't know what's happening in the brain in relation to the anxiety reduction and the body image change. Um, and this may be a fruitful avenue for additional investigative inquiry. So on that note, uh, I would like to conclude uh, and thank you for your attention and um, wish you a, a happy float conference, um, safe travels, uh, and I look forward to speaking with you further about this. Thank you.